And that means that we're doing something about helping people to see their houses, their own homes, as places of prayer. Now, if we were Jews or Muslims, this would be not news at all. We're both used to uh, praying in all places, and particularly for Jews, their homes being their place, main place of prayer. But for many Christians, it's a slightly different idea. And I wonder how much the last few months has changed people's idea about where they find God. Because we would like to be able to help people to see more clearly that God is with them all the time, and that means where they live as well. So we're thinking that by praying in our houses, we're helping people to think of their own houses as places of prayer. We've been encouraging people to join us regularly um, and perhaps to make a special space uh, and a special time for prayer, uh, to uh, create their own special corner or special chair or special position if they can in their houses. This is ours. We are obviously very blessed in able to have a, a place which is unchanging. But most people somewhere have got a candle in their house. Most people somewhere have got a cross or something which they can, can become a cross. Most people can put some flowers in something. Uh, there you see there's some slightly manky buttercups um, and, and some, uh, well, I, I, I think it's ground ivy, but I can't remember from that picture. These are weeds uh, in this in this vase. Um, I've just been picking some lavender as well uh, for a bit of smell, absolutely delightful. Uh, um, and these sort of things bring our mind to God to help us to uh, remind ourselves because we're very physically incarnated people. We can't live out of our brains, out of our minds, the whole thing. We need space, we need places, we need particular times, particular moments when we uh, concentrate intentionally on recalling God's presence, which is why we've encouraged people to, uh, uh, to, to know when we're doing it or to have a particular time when they look at the website or something like that. So that it becomes part of their habit, part of a pattern of prayer in their own homes. And it's out of that pattern, that habit, that deep sense that God is with them, that the spontaneous, the necessary, the emergency arrow prayers uh, develop. The, the sense that God is all around all the time because I spend some time in some spaces particularly concentrating on him. So we've been doing live stream, we've been doing recording, we've been doing those things which, you, uh, uh, which we've been looking at today. Most of the time, people don't see our faces. At the end of each of the service, we, we turn the cameras around the, the phone that we're, we're recording on uh, to, to give the notices, which is mostly what we're doing the next day, um, to say hi, say uh, we hope everyone's uh, having a, a reasonable day. Unfortunately, a couple of times to pass on some news of people in the fellowship who are not well uh, or who have died. Uh, but the actual prayer service, we haven't been showing our faces most of the time. For communion during the Eucharistic prayer, the camera's on us. But at other times, it's just this. This is the focus. This is the sort of thing that somebody could set up in their own house. And we've been encouraging people to pray to pray in their breathing, to pray in their yoga or exercises or whatever it is that they're doing. We've encouraged people to help uh, to pray uh, in adoration, in saying sorry, in saying thank you, and in praying their prayers and requests and intercessions as well. We've also encouraged people at the end of each day to do what's called an Ignatian examen. Um, and plenty of good websites on that. I'll put up some information about the examen. Another thing which encourages a daily pattern of prayer. What about distractions in the house? One of the reasons that people like coming to church, I think, is that they're able to put all the housework behind them. Uh, they're able to uh, not gaze at the windows as I am at the moment and thinking, good grief, they need cleaning. <laughs> the distractions which are all around us are probably exacerbated in homes. 
perhaps it helps to kind of park them to have a notebook or something like that if, if there is a distraction during our times of prayer. Um, or sometimes I have to say that, that in a time of prayer, when I have a thought, sometimes it's somebody I should be praying for. Something, it's something I should be doing, which I have forgotten. And I think it's God reminding me. Um, so distractions can be quite a blessing in some ways, as it's God's message to me at the moment. And I'm very cheered by those spiritual advisors who say that if we are distracted and we call ourselves back to God, that's like exercising a muscle. Every time we are distracted and we turn our attention back to God, we're practicing paying attention to God. So every time we're distracted, it's an opportunity to exercise that attention muscle as it were, in our spirits. What's that? Thank you for distractions. Because then we have the opportunity to be reclaimed by God. I'd be really interested to see what happens at the end of our lockdown. In many places with more elderly congregations or places where people have caring to do at home, it might well be that folk discovered that they can be part of a Christian community in ways that they didn't think was possible before. And that could well be one reason why we are being joined by so many people who never did have church as their primary place of prayer. And we're going to learn something, something very deep and meaningful, that God is with us all the time, even in our own homes. So those are my thoughts on helping people learn to pray in their own homes encouraging to have space time and dealing with the distractions i'd be really delighted if you use the chat uh, and pop up some other ideas um as i just begin to get some things ready uh, for the next bit but really glad to hear your reactions on on the chat thanks so much elizabeth thank you so much we'll let you uh, prepare to uh for the next um session i i find that really helpful and i think um, as you say, that um, this is a thing that clearly God wants us to learn at this time. I don't mean God caused coronavirus so that we would learn it. I don't think that at all. But I do think that since we got coronavirus, there must be things that God is teaching us in it that we would not learn any other way. And probably um, this idea that we are not a people who depend on holy buildings in order to have an opportunity for prayer is one of them. Well, thanks, Andy. Shall we move on to uh, helping people pray? Um, because that was very well, well, very well put. Um, you'll see also on the chat um, uh, in the space after lunch, I put a couple of uh, links. One is the link to the Wings for Worship course which we're going to look at. Um, and, uh, and then there's a couple of Vimeo links as well. Uh, Vimeo is another video sharing site uh, like YouTube. Um, the, these videos are on Vimeo because they've been sent off to the, the National Church of England site. And the guy in charge of that prefers Vimeo to YouTube. But I'm hoping they're going to go on the Dustin YouTube channel as well. So this session is about um, helping others leading worship um, and, and to be honest it's not very different uh, because we are um, thinking about online worship not hugely different there's um, um, a lot of the skills about leading worship are there whether you're doing them online or not the technical difficulties and, and, and technical issues that, that Tim and, and, and Sandra have taken us through um, are, are obviously very new, um, but the things like the pattern of worship that Andy's been talking about, and just the skill of leading worship, you know, that's not, not all that much different, really. Um, and it, it is probably the case that a lot of you uh, here today um, have thought, this is something you could help other people with. You could help them lead worship as well. Perhaps you've been asked to do to, to do that kind of thing. Um, 
So this is primarily for you, but I mean, if there's folk here who want to pick up a few ideas about skills for leading worship, hang in there, because I'm going to ask, um, well, I'm going to ask my, the very willing team of other people who are leading today to be the guinea pigs. Um, but have a go at home as well. So that first link, the Wings for Worship um, uh, link, will take you to a page on the DOS website. Um, uh, might take you to this page, it might straight, straight forward to the, on the DOS website, there's a page called Growing in Faith, that's under lay, lay ministry uh, and discipleship. Uh, and under here, there's all sorts of uh, resources, the courses that you can, uh, you can lead and run in your practice on, on, on the Bible, the shape course, on how to facilitate small groups, pastoral care, evangelism, those. That's a great one. Evangelism for seniors, as in what used to be called pensioners. Really good one for new leaders. And here's the Wings of Worship course. So let's click here. And that will download for us this course, which has been written by uh, people in Durham and Newcastle uh, diocese, who very generously said we can use it and adapt it for ourselves. But look here, they've written some Grove booklets and they say, you know, these are excellent booklets. These are booklets of um, 14, 16 pages, cost three and four pounds on different aspects. And those are the people who put the course together. Very, very kind and generous of them. The idea of the Wings for Worship course, it's, uh, you say, five sessions. And you could do it in five evenings. You could do it on two Saturdays. You could do it on three Saturday mornings. Yeah, I've done each of those. Whatever suits you locally, you could take a bit more time for some of the sessions. You could, for example, do one session on, lead, on, on reading the Bible or one session on leading prayers. Whatever your local situation needs. What I found time and time again is that people sign up for the first session because that's what they want to do. They want to learn how to read the Bible in church or to lead prayers. Well, you know, Nothing, nothing big to start off with, just kind of trying things out. Um, but then uh, they, they stay on, you know, if they have a good time, they stay on for other sessions as well. And you might well end up with them staying on. And what it does progressively is take you from those basic skills, which teach us so much about how to lead worship, through to thinking about the shape of the worship course, about being an assistant, about leading the person who's pulling it all together and then uh, being the one on your own. Not that really you ought to, you know, one's never on one's own leading worship, it's always a team effort. It, even if the team is the people who are giving out the service sheets, uh, welcoming the congregation, uh, organising music, uh, um, repelling um, invaders and disciplining the uh, troublesome, I say that, um, that, that's the troublesome adults. Most children, I have this theory, most children misbehave because they're copying adults. Um, so it starts off with reading the Bible in church. What I'd like to do is just stop sharing that for a moment and uh, share another um, uh, resource. One of the videos that uh, um, I was talking about. Um, These things will disappear, don't they? Just as you are thinking of where has that? Nope, sorry. And uh Hello, sorry. Um, is that reasonably, yes. Um, a little while earlier, somebody on the chat line said that it's very possible to um, add a narration to a PowerPoint presentation. So once you've made a, 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 an instruction, again, you look at, a, look at a YouTube video or PowerPoint instructions, how to do it. Um, and then you've got a resource which you can uh, deliver to people. Um, 
the idea of this one and the one on sessions is never that you play them all the way through for about, I think about 20 minutes, but that somebody could um, use this as a framework for doing some training delivery uh, and stop it at whenever they wanted to. So um, what I want to do is to go to one of the activities, which is at... is a way of getting your lips to move. When you're reading the lesson in church, you have to emphasize things a bit more than you feel comfortable with. It might sound as though you are overemphasizing, speaking too slowly, speaking as though in the cliche form you're talking to a foreigner loudly and clearly. But be assured that however much you emphasize things once you're up front, but by the time the sound reaches the back pew, it will sound about right. So emphasize the beginning and endings of the words and slow down. We all talk very fast in our part of the world. And especially if you're in a louder room, a larger room, you need to give some time for the noise to bounce around the ceiling, the floor, the back wall, and so on. Slow down. Perhaps to the pause after, uh, after a paragraph or something like that, giving the congregation time to digest the words that they've just heard. Do take some good deep breaths before you start. That's also a good way of relaxing yourself. And try to, to look up, speak to the back room, not to the floor. Remember that being clear is more significant than being loud. Whether you're in church or uh, you're speaking into a microphone in your own house or you're speaking into your phone, being clear is more important than being loud. So I'd like to ask uh, Andy, uh, uh, Sandra and Tim, if you wouldn't mind unmuting yourselves, because uh, uh, I, I, I want to hear some... Uh, you can ask people to practice speaking more clearly. Too many people rely on a microphone, but if you speak in a muffled way into the microphone, what comes out is a muffled microphone. Andy, could you say Peter Piper picked a peck of pickled pepper without any T's or any K's? P. P. Uh, Piper. Without any P's, was it? Peck. Peck. Uh, pick of. Old pepper. Yes, <laughs> lots of glottal. They're called glottal stops when you say Peter. Yeah. Oh. It's like speaking South End. Yes. <laughs> Sorry. This is not about speaking posh. Um, this is about speaking clearly, and it it is probably true that different dialects around the country do sound the ends of words or middle of words more than others. Um, Tim, could you say red lorry, yellow lorry, very clearly? Ah, oh. can't hear Tim? No. What you can see with Tim is his lips. Great, thank you. Sandra, Sandra Evans. Could you say Peter Piper picked pepper, 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 clearly? Peter Piper picked a peck of pickled pepper. Once again, you can see Sandra's lips moving. Andy, redeem yourself. Would you like to whisper very loudly, red lorry, yellow lorry? Red lorry, yellow lorry? I, I will never be redeemed, but... Once again, practicing. The thing about, whis about whispering is that it, it gets our lips moving. Uh, those of you who are singers, which is not me, will know all about taking plenty of air inside and, and breathing right, from, right deeply. Um, uh, that's what the 
the hymn before the reading is for. The hymn before the right above reading is, is, is there so that you can take lots of breaths so it also helps you calm down. Um, breathing, sounding the words, and talking to the person in the back of the, the, the pew, which is another reason for not talking to the microphone. Not talking over there, over there, whatever, talking ahead to you, but talking to the person a long way away. Let's think about learning to read the Bible. There's also lots on that video about uh, uh, finding out what the passage is about and, and all those sort of things. But that's perhaps the first skill for leading worship is being heard. Uh, there's another video there about leading intercessions. And the skill there, which is particularly to be emphasized, is helping people to realize that they're doing something for the congregation, leading the congregation in prayer. Because when you're leading worship, you're not an individual worshiper who happens to be up at the front. You're doing something which is in a different relationship to the congregation, helping the congregation to pray. I don't know, once again, ideas on chat. Is there anything else which is like leading worship? Is there any other activity which would resemble the kind of person that you are when you're leading worship? Any ideas? Pop them up on chat. It's the easiest way of uh, uh, communicating it, in, if that's possible. Teaching, says Caroline. Drama, acting, teaching. Presenting a game show. That's <laughs> facilitating a group. Yes. Yes. Being a tour guide. I like that very much. Facilitating group, teaching. Yeah. Yeah. I think there's a little bit of everything. And I think one of the helpful things when you're helping people to lead worship is to look at a service of worship and say, what kind of activities there are there which you're familiar with? Hmm. Some of those I thought with were things like um, being hospitable, yeah, being, being uh, having a passion, being, um, but being hospitable. You well, if you start off your worship, welcoming people. Come and join us. We're going to do this together. Um, and then there's a bit about announcements. That could be the bit about being the tour guide, or the facilitator, the announcer. That the 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 welcomer and the announcer are slightly different. And then there's the praying. Leading people in prayer is sometimes simply about praying yourself in a visible way. It's not always necessary to give everyone instructions. Sometimes just doing it yourself helps people do it. Certainly be, being a kind of model to everyone. There's the posture and the hand gestures. When I'm uh, presiding at that little table, it's very hard for me to, not to say, the Lord be with you! and knock everything off but there is something that's appropriate about our way of welcoming everybody and the way that we stand which is very different from being somebody in the congregation and there's something about leaving the congregation with some work to do as well so you say the lord be with you and don't say the response the congregation has a so all those things are slightly different from each other. You might say that introducing everybody is different from giving the notices. A different tone of voice. A slightly different attitude again to when you're praying yourself with people, leading folk. So the person of leading worship is being several different kinds of people. Ah, and he's got to think. So, Sandra, it's back to you again if you'd unmute yourself, Sandra. Yep. I'd like you to welcome people to worship in a really bored voice. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Yeah. Uh, nice to be here. Um, okay, let's get started, shall we? Something like that? <laughs> <laughs> Something like that. <laughs> Have you have you been to any people have been to a service like that, haven't they? When when the oh yeah, 
much yet. When the person is so bored who's leading it, you kind of wonder why they, you know, why they bothered. Um, uh, Andy, how would you uh, speak in a, in a tone of voice which you think is encouraging people to pray? What would you say? Um. So we're gonna, so, so let's breathe for a moment. Let's remember God's here. And let's turn to prayer. It's quiet. Not too wordy, uh, thank you, Andy. Quite different from saying there's coffee afterwards, please join and stay. Quite a different kind of uh, mood which was leading people into uh, an experience of prayer. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andy. So, reading the Bible teaches us to uh, understand what we're saying and to project it. Leading into sessions and thinking about the service of the worship helps us to think about who we are, what kind of people we are when we're leading worship. And as I say, the Wings for Worship course takes you through these different steps. Um, some of the, the, uh, the next sessions um, uh, help people to become familiar uh, with, the, uh, with the screen. So let's look at... It's gone again. And through the website, uh, and if you're able to look at that. Um, uh, let me tell you more about it then and we'll, we'll see if we can um, uh, uh, um, imagine that for ourselves. Um, the, uh, the, 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 the course is now in its very barest outline. I think when it was first developed in Durham and Newcastle, they produced lots and lots of handouts covering every eventuality. Uh, but as we delivered that in Chelmsford, we found that places differed from each other very much. So as, as Bishop Stephen was forever saying, it's a very diverse diocese. And what suited one place didn't suit another place. So one place really wanted to find out about the intricacies of the church year and the colours of the vestments and that sort of thing. Another place was completely uninterested in all that sort of thing. Some places had very formal worship or the Book of Common Prayer, uh, some places not. And so the course that exists at the moment uh, has only the barest wall. Uh, and the people who are leading are invited to, uh, uh, to provide what you want uh, uh, and to find uh, and have freedom. So it's not a course that you had to follow slavishly. But it's designed to take people from that initial consideration of those basic skills, reading the Bible, reading intercessions, thinking about who they are in worship, to then begin to put services together and within the Wings for Worship material, there's quite a bit on how to put a service together, how to find resources. You're also going to be able to find that on the So a lot of the practicalities, and again, those practicalities are going to change from place to place. So uh, the things that you need to get ready before worship are, are going to be very different, depending on what needs to be done. This is excellent. Uh, we've got some, some, thank you very much, Andy. If we could scroll down to uh, page 19. We could look at some of those, that sort of thing. So, Asking people to ask themselves questions before they start worship. So here's, this is an example of the way that the course might run. It doesn't tell you what to do. It, asks, it suggests some questions that you might ask yourself before you... And this relates to church, of course. Um, uh, you know, who's going to let you in? Who's going to turn the lights on? All those sort of things. Um, and some things will be a collection. Uh, 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 who else is taking part? Who do you need to be with? 
almost always and in every situation, I think this will be true online as well as in church, leading worship is going to involve liaising with somebody else. It's only publicity, which is great because it means that we don't uh, think that we can do these things on our own. We always need to work with other people. By the end of the course, uh, people should feel much more competent about uh, walking into uh, the responsibility of being the person who coordinates it. Um, thank you. If we just thank you, Andy. We'll, we'll, if you would, if you would just scroll down a bit uh, and look at another. Is that? Um, thank you. We'll start there. Um, to feel that, not that they are confident, um, uh, I, I think confidence is, is overvalued. I don't think confidence is a Christian virtue. In fact, yeah. I think confidence probably isn't a Christian virtue, it just seems to be popular. Um, you don't need to be confident at, at all. You need to be competent um, and rely on God. Confident in God, our confidence comes from God. Uh, we need to be reasonably competent at what we do or what we're asked to do. So there's something about doing things to the best of our ability and doing it in a way that brings glory to God, uh, not in the way that uh, uh, you know, makes us shine or, or look good or anything like that. I want to commend that, um, that course to you uh, because it's a, it's a nice basic framework for helping people. Um, and as I say, it starts off at a place which a lot of people are happy to join in with, and it might take them just a few steps beyond what they thought they were going to join in with. Um, uh, and, um, uh, uh, and be involved in leading worship. Thanks, Andy. Can we have back to you know, everybody seeing all the screen? Uh, I'm back on chat and see if there's uh, any questions. Um, We've had questions, but people putting up their hands and putting questions on chat. So, uh, whichever is going to work for you, because we've got a few minutes, I think. Any questions about helping people in the leading of worship? I guess a practical question. Suppose there was somebody on this call who was saying to themselves, I'd quite like to run a Wings for Worship course for people in my area. Um, what complicated process do they need to go through in order to be able to do so? I, I'm, I'm really glad. Thank you. Thank you, Andy. Um, the, uh, uh, it's always worth finding out whether anybody wants uh, uh, to, 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 to come to a course before you um, set up running it. Um, too many church activities are based on the idea that they are <laughs> organised. Sandra Baines, I think you want to remove, you know, turn your video off. Um, the, um, uh, yes, too many church courses are organised and then people are encouraged to come and made feel guilty for not coming, uh, uh, which seems uh, the wrong way around. But, but if there's a request, people want to, to, to do this, perhaps, perhaps dip their toe in, perhaps have a taster, um, perhaps after church, uh, perhaps an activity where you can just say, no obligations whatsoever, just come and have a go. You're not gonna get signed up. Um, really anybody can do that, really anyone. Um, we've um, particularly asked licensed lay ministers, it's true uh, in, in the diocese, to act as people who can help train and resource others. Um, and certainly, uh, people with a with a license will find that folk from other parishes we hope can trust them and, and think you know they've got kind of a diocesan and imprimatur um, find out uh, who locally would like to come not just your own church perhaps a neighboring church mission and ministry unit in the deanery um, put it on at a time uh, as i say perhaps an evening perhaps saturday morning something like that um, uh, and uh, I think you'll find that there are quite a few people who are just saying, yes, we might have a go, see how it goes and, and help us. Uh, and I think the advantage to the church of improving the way th 
that folk lead worship, the, folk, the way that folk read the Bible and lead in sessions, is just such a wonderful way of contributing to, to God's worship, to bringing our very best to him. So they don't need the permission of you or me or somebody who sits in an office in Chelmsford in order to run rings for worship. Well, that's that's the point of that list, that, that page on the website, which I did manage to show you. Of lots and lots of short courses. Yeah. That they're available for anybody without paying anything to anybody. They've all been freely offered for anybody to pick up at any time. Thank you. Making that quite clear. Well, thank you very much. Um, it's, it's um, I think, time for another break. You reckon? Yeah. So have another four o'clock. Uh, we're going to be pleased to welcome Bishop John here. So do put your questions for Bishop John in the chat box. And uh, we'll be delighted to get up and have a wriggle, breath of fresh air. And we'll see you back at four o'clock. <laughs>